there's several ways to approach stoic theory, but I think one of the best ones is to look at uh, stoicism in terms of two fundamental pillars, one of which is that we should live according to nature. Now, as soon as I say that, uh, people start stripping naked and running to the woods and you know, hugging trees and things like that. Fine, you can do that. But that's not what Stoicism is about. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. What it is, is, is this. The Stoics figure, look, if the, if the question is, how do I live a good life as a human being, then I have to answer another question. What the hell is a human being? Because if I don't understand human nature, then I'm likely to mislive my life, to make wrong decisions about my life. Uh, think about this. They thought about human beings as any other living organism. If somebody comes to your home and gives you a cactus, for instance, you have to ask yourself, what is a good life for a cactus? And you better answer correctly, otherwise the, that cactus is going to die uh, over the next few days because you're either giving too, too much water or not enough light or you know, things like that. Now, human beings are a little bit more complicated than cacti, but not that much. And according to the Stoics, there are two things that are really fundamentally important for human beings, other than the basics. I mean, we, like every other animal, we need to eat and sleep and you know, have sex, all that sort of stuff. That's fine, but that's, we share that with a lot of other animals, so it's not distinctive of human nature. It's just what we have in common with as animals. What is distinctive of human nature, according to the Stoics at least, are two things. We can think, and we're very social. So we tend to solve our problems by thinking about stuff. Reason is the way we, we uh, navigate life. Uh, compared to other animals, we don't have strong muscles, we don't run fast, we don't fly, we don't have fangs, nothing like that. But what we do is we solve problems by using our large brains. So reason is a fundamental component of a human life. The other one is sociality. We're not the only social animals, of course. These are bonobo chimpanzees, some of the closest relatives that we have. Uh, we're certainly not the only social animals, but we are incredibly more social uh, than anybody else. Our, our societies are much more structured, much more complex, much more interdependent uh, than any other animal uh, society. So the notion is, well, if this is what, what it means to be human, then it follows that a good human life will focus on using well these two characteristics. So to improve and use your reasoning abilities is a one important path toward a better life, and to improve your social relations is a good uh, way to live your life. So living according to nature just means think about your stuff, solving problems, and be as social as you can. The second pillar of Stoic philosophy is something that is uh, often referred to as the dichotomy of control, although the word control, as you'll see, uh, it's actually a little bit problematic because it immediately uh, Leads, it leads, leads itself to, to misunderstandings. Maybe we're going to talk about it a little, little later. But fundamentally, the dichotomy of control is this notion that some things are up to us and other things are not up to us, meaning that the, the buck stops with us on certain things. We are responsible for certain things, and for other things, we are not ultimately responsible. And that a good life is one in which we focus on the first and tend to ignore the rest or accept the rest as it is. Now, this is not just a stoic idea. It comes up in... Uh, 8th century uh, Buddhism, in 11th century Judaism, and in 20th century Christianity. Uh, you might have heard of the Serenity Prayer. The Serenity Prayer asks, which was written by an American theologian in the early part of the 20th century, and asks God to give us the wisdom to tell the difference between what we can change and what we cannot, the courage to change what we can, and the serenity to accept what we cannot. That's pretty much the dichotomy of control. And in fact, it's not by chance that you find it in Christianity, because the Christians got it straight from the Stoics. Here is Epictetus on the dichotomy of control. This is the way he explains it. He says, some things are up to us while others are not. Up to us are opinion, motivation, desire, aversion, and in a word, whatever is our own doing. Not up to us are our body, property, reputation, office, and in a word, whatever is not of our own doing. Now, these words, are the, the first group is a little misleading because when it's translated in English, like desired, are the, my desires really up to me? But in fact, if you look at the Greek words, it's much more clear what it means. Essentially, what Epictetus is saying here is that the things that are really up to me are my own considered judgments. If I make a decision about something, if I arrive at a, conclu a conclusion, that is my own conclusion. I can't blame other people. I can say, yeah, I was influenced by this or that or the other. I read this or that or the other. But ultimately, it is my judgment and my own decision. I'm responsible for it. The values that we endorse, 
Right? If we agree on something or disagree on something, we think that something is important or non-important, that's also us. We can be influenced again by others, but ultimately it comes down to our decision and our decisions to act or not to act. Okay? When, if I decide to come here and, you know, in London despite a pandemic and all that sort of stuff, that's my decision. I can't blame anybody else. Okay? If I get sick because of COVID, I'm the, I'm the one to blame. I can't say, oh, well, but, you know, there was other people. Whatever, it doesn't matter. I made the decision, so it's up to me, right? Notice what is not up to me. Pretty much everything else. Body, meaning your, your health. Property, your, your wealth and possessions. Reputation. Office, meaning your career. Now, of course, we all think, well, wait a minute, but I can definitely influence all those things. Yes, you can. But ultimately... The outcome does not actually depend on you. It's not in your control. Take body because we're in the middle of a pandemic as an example. Right? So what is up to you in the middle of a pandemic? Well, to understand what a pandemic is and what a virus is, that doesn't mean you need to become an epi epidemiologist or a virologist. Just a minimum, you know, at least Wikipedia level understanding of, of these things. Why? Because they inform your decisions. Uh, you can decide to get vaccinated as soon as the vaccine is possible, to wear masks uh, when it's not necessary, to maintain social distance, to keep washing your damn hands every five minutes, you know, that sort of stuff. Those are up to you. But those fall into these things. Those are your judgments, your decisions to act or not to act, your uh, endorsed values. Whether you get sick or not does not depend on you because, believe me, I'm a, bi I'm a biologist. Viruses are sneaky damn things. You can do everything right and still get sick. Of course, if you do everything right, you're far less likely to be sick, right? So you influence the outcome, but you don't determine it. And so for a stoic, you need to focus on the first part. Make the right decisions, understand the situation, and then live with whatever consequences come out, because the consequences are not up to you. That's the dichotomy of control. Now, Cicero, not a stoic, but uh, a philosopher, a uh, Academic skeptic was his philosophy, but a philosopher who uh, was definitely sympathetic to the Stoics, and actually a lot of what we know about Stoicism comes from Cicero, came up with this really interesting analogy to explain the dichotomy of control. He said, if a man or woman or whatever, you know, update the language to the 21st century, were to make, make it his purpose to take a true aim with a spear or arrow at some mark, like this guy over here, his ultimate end would be to do all he could to aim straight, whereas the actual hitting of the mark would be, in our phrase, to be chosen but not to be desired. In other words, what you're doing in life is you act like an archer. The archer has under his own power to uh, select the bow and the arrows, to take care of them, to uh, practice archery, to uh, focus during the actual shot, and then to decide the moment to, when, when it is the moment to let the arrow go. That's it. As soon as the arrow is gone, all sorts of other things can happen. The enemy soldier can turn at the last moment, see it, duck it, and you're done. Uh, just the wind comes in and ruins the best shot. The outcome is not up to you, but the preparation and the intentions are up to you. And so the notion here is basically that you should internalize your goals. Focus on what is up to you, and then prepare to accept the outcome, regardless of what it is. That applies everywhere. Um, career, relationships, stuff like that. So let me give you a couple of examples. So suppose that you, tomorrow you are up for a job interview. It comes natural to us to focus on the outcome. Will I get the job or will I not get the job? But according to the Stoics, that's exactly the wrong focus because getting the job is not up to you. It's up to whoever interviews you. It depends on factors that are not up to you, like your competition. What is up to you is to put forth the best resume possible for that particular job, to uh, focus during the interview, to dress appropriately and show up on time at the interview, or try to show up on time in the interview, because you know, if there's too much traffic or the, the uh, tube is not working, then, then it's not up to you either. Uh, not going out uh, with friends drinking tonight, because you know, that's probably going to interfere with your sleeping patterns, and therefore tomorrow you're not going to be uh, doing a good interview. So those are the things that are up to you. The outcome is not. Relationships. Again, comes naturally, oh, I want him or her to love me, to be, etc. Wrong, that's up to them, not up to you. What is up to you is how you behave toward them. Right? You be, you focus on your part, being a loving person, understanding, being around, that sort of stuff. Then it's up to, the, uh, to your partner whether they reciprocate or not, to what extent they reciprocate or not, and so on and so forth. Right? 
Now, if you do that, Epictetus makes a really big promise. He says that you'd be happy and serene. He says, if you had the right idea about what really belongs to you, meaning what is up to you, and what does not, meaning what is not up to you, you will never be subject to force or hindrance. You will never blame or criticize anyone, and everything you do will be done willingly. Because everything you do, you try to do, is under your control. The outcomes are not, but your decisions are. And so you're not going to blame any, anybody else. You're going to be fine, serene, uh, and accepting, ideally accepting the outcome. Of course, it takes practice to get to that point, but that's the idea. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.